Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to High Water Women's Accelerating Impact Program on Technology. Um, we're excited about the panel that we have here today and look forward to hearing from our panelists and hearing from you, our audience as well, through your questions. So High Water Women is a small nonprofit um, dedicated to empowering women and for social change. We have three core programs. Um, we have a financial literacy program where we teach financial literacy across the greater New York area. We also do an annual backpack drive and we also have um, accelerating impact programming, which is really designed to engage and educate investors around impact investing. So how can we use capital markets for social change while generating um, income and profits and building economies? So we have launched Accelerating Impact as an outgrowth of the work that we've done with our annual symposium. Um, and COVID-19 perfectly lines up with this transition. Um, so we've been in, because we can't meet in person this year, we are grateful to have this programming where we're meeting virtually um, over the course of the next 12 months um, at a minimum. But we look forward to being able to see you all in person one day, uh, probably in 2021. So, we have two upcoming sessions after this session, climate change. Um, we have a session on diversity innovation coming up on November 5th, and also a session on fixed, the fixed income portfolio um, coming up on November 19th. So keep an eye out for those. If you haven't registered to attend, please do so. Um, and if you need more information, feel free to email me um, directly. Um, today, we're here to talk about technology disruptions in sustainability, trillions at risk and trillions to be made. Um, and I want to turn it over to um, Alex Hyvey, who is on our Young Women's Council. Okay. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, and so welcome to what we hope to be a very exciting and um, interesting panel um, in the middle of your Wednesday. We have some awesome panelists who we're excited to introduce um, one by one in the beginning of this session. I'm going to give you a quick high level um, overview of what the agenda entails, a little bit of housekeeping, um, and we're just going to get right into it because there's a lot to talk about. Um, so our agenda today is going to start, as I mentioned, with the panelist introductions, um, moderated by Carolina Abramo. Um, following that, we're going to dive into sort of a discussion on a lot of different themes and topics. Um, this group is particularly well suited to talk about um, electric vehicles, batteries, um, and those types of things. So we've sort of used that as a, a case study or a thread that um, holds all all the different experiences together. Um, so feel free to prep any questions on that. Um, we're looking to touch on topics that include um, how tech will accelerate obsolescence, um, specifically how also um, there can be concentration risk or general risks to investors associated with tech innovation and investments. Um, the impact of news and media on a lot of this type of innovation and what is considered cool and given airtime versus not as well as some public policy considerations um, and other, other hot topics. Um, so the session goal, which we hope you will all um, feel you leave this session with, is to help you appreciate the acceleration of new products and investments to combat climate change um, due to the implications of technology. So as I mentioned, each panelist has sort of a different point of view and experience um, that they will bring to this sort of ecosystem of climate and tech and innovation. Um, so we're really happy to be able to offer all of you these unique perspectives sort of in one package. Um, so as I mentioned, if you go back one slide, Imogen, to the agenda, we will have the panelist intros. We'll do a panelist discussion um, on those uh, talking points. And then there is time at the end for an open Q&A, but we would encourage all of you to um, ask questions at any time. There should be a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And so if you type that in there, I personally will uh, be managing it. And so I'm happy to see to 
um, the fact that those make it to the panelists and, and all your burning questions are answered. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Caroline. Um, take it away. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much um, to, to all of you, to High, high Water Women, uh, for this opportunity to have this panel and, and, this, and these, uh, these, these sessions. Um, I'm Carolyn Abramo. I'm the CAO and founder of PANA Low Carbon Economy Investments, based in New York City. I think that the name says a lot of it. Um, we look for impact and uh, impact investments when it comes to climate redu reducing GHGs, essentially getting us to the Paris Accord goals to not raise surface temperatures by 1.5 degrees. We focus on companies that can accelerate technology. Um, we also focus on infrastructure, so the implementation of those technologies. I'm so thrilled to be here uh, with my fellow panelists, who I'm going to introduce, and they've been, you know. They've been handpicked and curated by High Water Women. They've gotten a rounded view, um, as Alex said, um, on this topic um, and come from different perspectives. So we have, we'll start with, with Christina, Christina Lampe, as our, as our entrepreneur uh, on this panel. Um, and Christina, if you could please introduce yourself and tell us uh, what you've been doing um, and your priorities in the space. Oh, there we go. I'm mute as well. Thank you. All right. Uh, very happy to be here. Uh, really looking forward to these discussions. Um, I came from the science and tech side, uh, PhD in chemistry, minor mathematics, post at MIT, uh, decided not to stay on the academic track, but uh, instead uh, embraced the passion to be a collaborator and um, turned out to be a really good skill set at uh, disruption that I have lived through in multiple places. Uh, I was part of the portable power disruption where battery technology empowered um, paradigm of 24 seven on cell phones and laptops. I was there when EVs first started in Japan and uh, then uh, really took off in China through European and uh, initial US efforts. And now super passionate of seeing these markets grow, continue to participate in that and have uh, recently invented a battery technology that cannot explode. So you can put it under your bed and into your cars and can go into very expensive buildings. And uh, it's a Lego block of energy that basically enables safe energy storage and load leveling. So very, very passionate about finding technologies that solve a problem rather than the opposite of cool technology looking for a problem to solve. Uh, I've devoted a little bit of time to World Economic Forum. I'm a two-time tech, uh, two tech pioneer with them, but she's an analysis as well. Uh, really thrilled to be here today. Thanks so much, Christina. Now moving to our, our VC investor, Ali Yost. Hi everyone, um, my name is Ali. I'm a principal at The Engine. Um, I am just as a, a context, I'm a sort of scientist turned VC. I started as a researcher in my career, um, did my graduate work at MIT in material science and then got the startup bug and worked at a few, um, at a MIT spin out focused in the space industry. Um, but when The Engine got stood up, I jumped, jumped over into the venture world. I'll, um, and a lot of that was due to our mission. And so um, in terms of what the engine is doing, we are a venture fund that is dedicated to what I, I call tough tech. Um, and what I mean by that is things that are deeply rooted in scientific and engineering breakthroughs, oftentimes being developed in academia, in research labs, although that's not a requirement, um, but with the opportunity to solve a lot of the world's largest problems. And so I think our mission is to accelerate the path to market for these types of companies. We are primarily a seed stage investor. So typically investing um, right at the gate T equals zero for these companies. Um, we, I would say, even though we have this sort of tough tech umbrella, um, if I look at where our portfolio seems to land, I think we've invested in 27 companies so far, and at least 50% of them fall into the bucket around climate mitigation in some way, whether it's in direct energy, electricity production, decarbonizing big sectors like um, emissions-free steel production or hydrogen production, 
or even on the food and agriculture side, like um, more sustainable um, food production. Um, in addition to our fund, so we were sort of set up uniquely um, spun out of MIT and we have a mission to kind of clear the path. So we have a fund, but in, in addition to that, we also um, have a few other pillars that we think help um, ease the frictions at the early stage of these companies. We also operate a large amount of infrastructure that's dedicated to the needs of these types of companies. So not only in office space, but more importantly, access to labs, machine shops, all the analytical tools that are the bread and butter of these types of companies. Um, and in addition to that, we spend a lot of time building out a network that's specifically dedicated to tough tech. I think we all realize that um, a lot of times uh, the companies that make it um, in these sectors like energy require a lot of collaboration, not just between um, the entrepreneurial environment, but with large strategics and government on the regulatory and policy side, um, as well as innovation coming out of the code of academic side. So we spend a bunch of time trying to bring together that group um, in addition to our primary mode of investing. Thanks a lot, Allie. And I forgot I forgot to ask Christina, but I'll ask you and I'll come back to her, is what, what your favorite technology is? is it... Oh, <laughs> you know, we're not supposed to have favorites <laughs> as a VC, but I will say, um, I think something that is really exciting for us is we invested in a company called Commonwealth Fusion Systems, which is aiming to commercialize the first commercial fusion energy um, device. And I think that is clearly a game changer in our road to decarbonization. And we're really excited about that, that company. And I think um, related to that, it's sort of predicated on a novel materials innovation. And that material innovation is called a high temperature superconductor. But this material kind of has implications beyond just fusion, um, but a lot of things on in the electricity world, um, enabling um, applications from more efficient transmission to other applications in uh, supercritical geothermal. So if I had to pick one, that would be it. Um, but we love all of our children. <laughs> Excellent. Perfect answer. Um, so moving to our an, what, an allocator and consultant and a, and a huge voice in the space, um, Lee Chen Ma from Cambridge. Hi, everyone. It's great to be with you all today. Um, I'm, my name is Lee Chen Ma, and I head up our sustainable and impact investing efforts at Cambridge Associates. I'm based in Boston. And we work with a number of institutional investors across the board, whether it's endowments and foundations, family offices, um, sovereign wealth funds, and pension funds on their entire portfolios or on a specific asset class. And you can imagine just the amount of interest and engagement we've gotten over the recent years around whether it's ESG integration, diversity, equity, inclusion, and, and specifically for, for this topic and this discussion, focus on environmental sustainability and climate change mitigation, uh, which is you know where I spent a lot of my time uh, talking to clients and working with clients, building portfolios, focus on solutions. Um, and that can be across the full spectrum of, of, of asset classes and, and tools whether it's an early stage venture, which we'll spend a lot of time today talking about, to larger you know, growth equity, private equity, and then ultimately to infrastructure deployment, right? Um, ultimately, a lot of these technologies need to be commercialized and scaled up to large projects, whether it's through project finance or, or other infrastructure type uh, assets. And you do need all of the above to make a dent in countering the effects of climate change uh, and also ultimately for adaptation efforts. Um, unfortunately, I think we are at that stage where mitigation alone is not sufficient. You do need to combine it with adaptation efforts um, to minimize the damage done, uh, whether it's to you know, physical risks of climate change to especially those in lower income and marginalized communities across, across the globe. And speaking of that, um, my personal interest in climate change actually stems from part of my my own journey and upbringing. Uh, I was born and, and raised in the um, uh, in China, mainland China, 
And growing up there in the mid to late eighties, where, um, you know, at the time, right, coal was actually rationed by the central government. And I distinctly remember going with my grandfather to our government rationed coal warehouse, bring that coal back. And my grandmother would use that coal to cook our dinners and cook our meals. So our, literally our survival depended on coal. Um, and that is still the case for um, billions of people across, uh, especially the emerging markets. Um, and just seeing the, the devastating, devastating impact of a fossil driven generation um, economy and seeing the health effects of that, you know, made me appreciate the need to transition, right, for, um, uh, you know, to a cleaner and lower carbon economy. And, and that's um, what I'm bringing into my role currently and working with our research team, with our client team to make sure that we can transition effectively into a lower carbon future. Happy to talk about specific approaches later on. Great to be with you all today. Thanks, Lee Chen. And, wait, and what's your favorite technology these days? Yeah, so um, I think a lot of talk has been on um, the integration of right, hardware and software. And I think Ali talked about some of the material science innovations. I think those are all very exciting. What I've been spending a little bit more time on uh, recently is the intersection between life sciences and climate solutions. Uh, so huge, you know, an important innovation in, um, in genomics, right, in uh, human life sciences with, with tools to enable game-changing therapeutics for cancer, uh, personalized medicine. And believe it or not, a lot of those technologies, whether it's CRISPR, um, you know, gene editing, or other biological targeted therapies can actually be applied to plant health. And if you think about agriculture, right, huge emitter in terms of uh, greenhouse emissions and the tools that we have to control pests, to control for, for drought, right, can be very blunt. And if you have more targeted therapies, so to speak, for these types of challenges, um, you can actually address both, you know, food security, environmental sustainability, and ultimately um, climate adaptation uh, and resilience. So really interesting innovations and developments there that we're seeing, especially in, in Boston, uh, where there's a lot of life science innovation happening. Perfect. Thank you so much. So on to Nick Gogarty, our, risk, our macro risk manager, also an entrepreneur. Sure. Nick. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll give a little background. Um, before that, uh, housekeeping, uh, all the statements I make about energy or, or related um, are not direct statements of uh, my employer or you know, our sub-employer, um, Occidental. Um, my own background is a deep tech finance. Um, so I mean, I'm an Ivy League author on macroeconomics and innovation uh, for uh, Columbia University. Um, have worked with um, world's largest hedge fund, renewable energy analyst, blah, 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 uh, on the finance side trader, et cetera. Um, also developed a renewable energy currency uh, based on blockchain uh, called SolarCoin, uh, now plugged into platforms that track 5% of global solar energy. Um, and on, on the tech side, I was formerly chief analyst uh, for a project modeled on the MIT Media Lab in Europe, uh, where I was overseeing 70 PhD level projects, uh, life sciences, AI, material sciences, you name it. Um, so I'm, I'm a desperate wannabe nerd um, with an anthropology degree. <laughs> uh, I've won an MIT um, uh, Solve Award for blockchain-based health solutions at the UN, uh, have advised the, the G20 on sustainable finance, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, my hobbies are you know, a six-year-old daughter and uh, macroeconomic um, modeling uh, on a first principles basis for network theory. My day job is with uh, Carbon Finance Labs um, where I help come up with solutions um, financial solutions and innovations um, for Occidental low carbon ventures, um, supporting the efforts of an $800 million uh, direct air capture facility. Um, and that involves uh, developing the carbon credits, the methodologies, also developing a blockchain based uh, accounting mechanism to track the carbon intensity of any form of mass across the supply chain. Um, the idea is that you can differentiate any product um, by its carbon intensity. Unilever, for example, is gonna be tracking uh, carbon intensity and, and putting them on labels for 70,000 SKUs in Europe. And that'll happen uh, either from a regulatory or voluntary perspective soon. And the voluntary uh, carbon market is tiny. Very few people wake up in the morning to buy carbon. 
Um, but uh, they will consume it uh, if it's embedded within a product, the same way we buy organic products. I think that's um, super interesting uh, to drive uh, both behavior and uh, carbon demand in a very tiny market. The voluntary market's you know, a billion dollars, it's not there yet. So I help um, do that. And I've done a lot of research in EVs and displacement and um, uh, technology. I'll, I'll leave it there. So Nick, so your favorite technology is the is the Unilever technology? Uh, no, no, you know, actually, I don't want to talk my own book um, around you know director capture or, or stuff that sounds boring like accounting, but uh, the reality is empires run on plumbing. Uh, whether it's the Roman Empire, or ours, right? The internet is 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 info tech plumbing. Um, so I think my favorite tech um, would probably be anything that enables two. Th I'll I'll say two. Anything that enables smaller distributed energy. Uh, for its potential impact in the developing world, um, et cetera. So uh, cheap high density um, uh, storage um, and high density generation. Uh, I, I won an award at uh, one of the climate talks for a distributed energy solution using solar and blockchain and storage. Uh, I'm a big fan of sustainable economic development. That was my undergrad. So um, cheap distributed energy uh, is super interesting uh, where it's expensive, either off grid or at the edges, and it will end up uh, building resilience uh, for the grid. Um, the other tech would be some of the early exploration in, in, in geoengineering and, and weathering. But. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So moving into the, the core of our discussion. So we figured uh, that we would start uh, with some of uh, the case example we mentioned earlier that, you know, really, you know, battery technology is really the key to a lot of the areas that we're all looking at. In fact, you know, most recently we had Tesla Battery Day. Um, which to be, as we talked as a panel before, we realized that maybe this is not most, the most sexy topic, but it's one that's really important. So just really thinking about, you know, again, the, the drivers and the technology that have, that really have to be implemented um, versus maybe, you know, what seems exciting and maybe, you know, sexy and innovative, um, you know, to, to investors. But just to start with, the, with batteries, I thought Christina could give us a, you know, just a, you know, her, her background, just some of the current challenges and opportunities um, that she sees, you know, in, in the battery world. Sure, absolutely. So batteries is something everybody knows. It's something we have all grown up with, and it's something that will stay in this economy for a long time. We have uh, a lot of experience in how to charge and not charge and how to basically be reliant on batteries. Our expectation is that they work all the time if we charge them when we're supposed to. Uh, we have grown accustomed to batteries being smaller and having more energy density. We have grown accustomed to, um, uh, first the world wanted to standardize but that's actually not happening. We are seeing a lot of different innovation that is going to solve specific problems. So the, the giant two chemistries that, or the classes of batteries remain lead acid technology, which still is half of the market. And the other half is roughly lithium ion. So lead acid still sits in your starter battery of your car. It is used in um, most of remote areas, especially for telecom in the developed world. And it is the easiest accessible technology in developing regions. The lithium ion market took off um, on the heels and in stark competition with nickel cadmium batteries that really revolutionized what we thought of portable tools and then nickel metal hydride batteries that couldn't really reach the use flexibility that then lithium ion could do. So lithium ion is roughly four to six times the energy density per volume and weight of lead acid. So it became a clear winner when we were able to shrink that into small footprints. And lithium ion, of course, is, is interesting because lithium is element number three, but it can be paired with the whole first row of transition metals in the periodic table. And you can dope in a lot of different elements, uh, both metals and non-metals, and basically tweak the voltage a little bit to keep um, basically thermal profiles a little bit differently. You can manipulate costs that way. So it's a super, super flexible platform. And it is uh, now, of course, a very, very large industry. Already 15 years ago, billions of lithium ion batteries were produced. Uh, the technology started really in the US and Europe, uh, 
the Japanese picked it up very quickly and transitioning with a portable power revolution. Sony became an icon very quickly and uh, the Japanese economy in the electronic space grew around their infrastructure and their knowledge. The Koreans followed to basically say, we're gonna disrupt and change how we think about cost and performance. And then the Chinese entered and the Chinese today dominate the space. And of course, there are opportunities for multiple regions as this is becoming a mainstream technology. In addition, there are a lot of very interesting work happening right now. And as an entrepreneur, we always celebrate each other when we come up with crazy ideas. Um, and there are three bosses in the space going forward if we want to be serious about climate change. Uh, the ease of use into the paradigm uh, which includes existing supply chains and understanding how to basically use the technology is really, really important. The total cost of ownership, as we think about what cost is, and this is uh, one of the topics we will discuss, which is very difficult, uh, that these new technologies need to compete in an old paradigm that has a different structure than what the new technologies basically are needing. So that's one interesting, so how do you really define cost and what is longevity? And then the, the last part, of course, is reliability and safety. So what type of risks are you willing to take when you put something out far away in a mountain range and you can hit a thermal window, let's say it's really hot there, so that's actually really important, but there are really no, no people around, it's a super remote area, it's a very different specification than if you're gonna go into Rockefeller Center in New York City where you have a very expensive building and lots of people going in and out. So the considerations are also changing and the paradigm shift is happening now in parallel with technology development. So how urgently do we need this? Is this something that should be deployed tomorrow? Uh, are we willing to wait 10 years, 30 years? Um, I think it generally investors have uh, both gotten super excited when something new is developed and a little bit underestimated how long it takes to actually scale and have impact. And yet um, investors today have a chance to make an enormous impact by taking something that is ready to scale and get it deployed. So that's an unbelievable and frankly unparalleled opportunity. Portable power is big, but when we go into massive infrastructure to team up with this data revolution and access points where people become responsible for their own footprint and inspired by the opportunity you yourself can contribute and you can monitor and you can sell and trade energy, that's a whole new ball game. And you can be an asset owner, you can rent it, or you can share your real estate. And there are so many business models. So this is a time where you have new inventions that are coming into market right now. Regulatory frameworks are being developed as we speak. Some of them are way too lax and some of them are way overkill. Um, but we will figure this out and it's not going to be one technology. It's not going to be one person. It's going to be movement of people who act actively engage to make this happen. And uh, for all of us who care, who are on this call and um, engaged in general, we care and we will, we will fail and we will succeed uh, together and also apart, but the opportunity should be an inspiration for all of us. Thanks, Christina, that was wonderful. Nick, tell yeah. us in, ter in terms of, you know, we talked a lot about rights law, um, yeah. cost curve analysis and just the, by nature of that with innovation is that you're, you're, you're constantly, you know, putting, putting one technology almost out of business or making it obsolete and another one um, rising to the, to, the, to, to, the, to the front. So could you tell us a little bit about that and your perspective um, on, that, on that part of, sure. of, of batteries? What I'm going to talk about is, is um, some of the things that are in my in my book, but they're also fairly well known uh, principles or first principles to technology. A lot of people, when they think of a technology, think of a specific type, right? It's lithium ion, it's it's X, it's a type of solar cell, etc. And the reality is, um, technology exists within niches, like uh, like a species in an environment. And that those niches are constantly changing and dynamic and the performance characteristics are dynamic. Um, the nice thing is, and this is gonna sound quite paradoxical to the investors and the others in the room is, um, those things are predictable. How a technology evolves and how a technology niche evolves. Solar cells, for example, you could watch the cost performance curve drop over 30 years. 
some people are like, well, that's really interesting for solar cells, right? As you double the production of solar cells, the cost dropped um, over a period is called Swanson's law. The macro phenomena is called Wright's law, where you double the units shipped of any specific thing and the cost drops a certain percentage. Um, I've shared a, um, a, a, a little tool, a widget, um, and if someone wants to put that up into the chat uh, for, for the attendees, they can play around with it. But basically what it allows you to do is predict where the cost performance curve for something's going to go based on its performance. Now, as an investor, that's interesting and important for two reasons. One, uh, if you invest in a new tech, ask the question when it's gonna die. Its economic death will be a function of the rate of growth relative to the market. That's a paradox. The faster the growth of the market, the faster your tech dies. Um, the flip side of that is the faster the growth of the market, um, the faster the disruption impacts. So some of the work I did in EVs and the title of this presentation is Trillions Disrupted. Um, when I looked at EVs, uh, BNF, IE, IEA is terrible, by the way, for technology, never rely on them, um, uh, you know, found that uh, battery storage, et cetera, the density factors, the shipment of vehicles um, potentially has the impact uh, for a destruction of value um, in terms of stranded assets for the oil and gas sector, about $50 trillion. And that is trillion. Uh, basically, you're looking at by 2025, two and a half to three million barrels a day of oil destruction uh, because of EVs. Um, you know, and and we could say that's that's probably a good thing. Um, and that's super interesting. Uh, that represents you know the shift in these curves. That's one of the other important things about technology is um, disruption has two sides, right? There's a positive and a negative. Someone is getting disrupted. That's an investment opportunity as well in terms of how those firms pivot, exit, or don't. Um, I think I'll just you know may, may, maybe kind of um, leave it there. EVs are going to be super exciting in, in 2018, um, and and batteries as well. You know, in 2018, BNF and and the rest of the gang who make those predictions, we're talking about one terawatt hour of storage. Um, that's equivalent, you know, one terawatt hour is a lot of storage. They were talking about that being shipped annually in 2030. Okay, Tesla battery day, you know, a few weeks ago said they were gonna do three terawatt hours in 2030. So the space is radically underestimated by almost all of the analysts. I have not seen any really get it right. And basically the fun thing I do is I like to do meta analysis and first principles thinking. So I hate reading people unless they explain what they're doing or show their models, hence my allergy to the IEA. Um, but one of the fun things to do is look over anybody who's making a prediction. And the first question you should ask about them isn't really what their prediction is, it's how do they do the job? Were they good three years ago, four years ago? What were they saying? Very few people wanna own up to their past. And so if you look over the past predictions from Bloomberg New Energy Finance, IEA, et cetera, you will see one clear trend. They have all missed and they've all missed the same direction. They're all underestimating the scope and scale of the energy market. And if you take the Delta, the fun thing is it's nearly consistent. So they're underestimating consistently. So as long as someone has a bad model, that's fine. If it's consistently bad, it's useful. Um, as they say in math, you know, all models are wrong. They're maps, right? They're not the real territory. Some models are useful. So in the investment business, it's almost impossible to find someone to predict the future. But if you can find someone who predicts the future badly and consistently, they may be useful. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Nick. And Ali, from your perspective on these concepts of the fact that you're just, you know, we have to, you know, regenerate ideas, frankly, or technologies, you know, and you're you're running a portfolio of investments. How how does this stack up for you? And and what and what do you see? Yeah, I think you know, I I appreciate Nick's comments around um, people's ability or lack thereof to predict the future. Um, I think you know my general sentiments are, I think there are already a lot of options for deployment today that need to be deployed. And you can say that to be true in the electricity sector, like solar wind storage, you can also say that in batteries. Um, and that will get us, you know, partially the way there. And that's happening. And the question is, is how do we go beyond to get to really this like long term 100% decarbonized economy. And in particular, in sectors that are harder to decarbonize. And I think the answer is innovation. And I think there's been an emerging body of evidence in the energy sector that startups are more likely to fund 
high risk, high reward, high impact technical projects compared to the large incumbents that have incentives that are to show growth on like, you know, a quarterly uh, basis. And that's not really always aligned with the longer timelines associated with these innovative pro uh, projects. I think, you know, the engine, um, we are structured in a way to be aligned with these longer timelines. I think our fund in itself is sort of a different, a different take a little bit on the venture fund model and that we have a longer time horizon. Um, I think when we look at, you know, areas uh, to focus on and in the lens of like the um, battery example, I think a lot about sort of how we can enable the trend that's happening, but in sort of like, uh, especially since we focus on this sort of early, early side of it is like, what is the second wave that will help enable what's happening? And so what that looks like, I think, ends up being looking across the whole value chain around batteries. So for example, we invested in a company called Lilac Solutions. And essentially what they're doing is commercializing a novel method for lithium extraction, which um, recovers twice as much lithium at half the cost with way smaller footprint in land and a lot faster processing speed. And I think, you know, to Christina's point, um, if you want to follow some of the trends, like one of the big bets is on lithium ion and it's continuously going down the cost curve. Um, but an interesting thing too, is that the market, you know, right now is, I think as of 2018 was something like four or $5 billion, but in the 100% electric, electrified vehicle scenario, it's something like a $120 billion market. And so I think that's one where it's not quite, we're not necessarily investing in a, a new battery per se, but we're in investing in a new process upstream um, to enable that sort of uh, deployment. Um, I think there's, I've seen a lot of other, other things. Um, you know, we have a company that's focused on, on um, super critical uh, drilling for geothermal, but they have a lot of uh, possible opportunities in the mining space to make mining and extraction of materials more efficient and therefore more sustainable. Um, we also, you know, we haven't invested in these companies, but I've seen a few that are also really interesting on other pieces of the of the chain where, you know, um, downstream on the battery recycling technology. So I think, you know, figuring out ways to kind of unlock those materials, especially when a lot of them are not uh, currently widespread <laughs> available. Um, and also really interesting things, even on kind of the uh, software side where people who are applying, you know, innovations in artificial intelligence or machine learning, whichever you want to call it, um, to do better exploration of where to find nickel, cobalt, lithium, copper, critical materials that will be needed um, and better design around the next electrodes or um, material innovations for batteries. So that's sort of how I think we we view our role in the in the greater ecosystem and sort of how the lens that we, we come through it. Thanks, Ali. Lots of places to learn about, even you know within all you know within batteries. Um, it, now, just think, taking like a a little bit of a, a wider view, um, Li Chen. So, in your seat and what, the way that you look at something like batteries. So, um, and also the fact that I mean, from a you're looking thematically at something that's going to have you know real impact, um, you know, climate reduction but also the way in which you can support, you know, the, these technologies. So we mentioned, you know, venture, which, you know, Ali is representing then growth equity and infrastructure. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how, you know, you're viewing the application in, in those areas. Um, you know, basically how can you actually make an investment, you know, kind of along that spectrum? Yeah, absolutely. And I have to say, Nick and Ali, you set me up well with your comments because from an allocator's perspective, right, we do get to see a lot from our seat. We don't really get to go super deep as you do on technology, on specific startups necessarily, but we do get to see the connections between technology companies and ultimately, you know, asset classes all kind of interacting with each other. Uh, and when we're building portfolios, we have to think more um, through a systems lens, right? Um, to make sure that entire portfolios, not distinct investment, but, this, but entire portfolios are moving us in the right direction. So just to take um, you know, Nick's comments about you know, cost curves and, and rights law, I think the institutional investor community 
in general, and, and, and sorry if I'm offending anyone in that in that category by making this statement, but I think myself included, right? Institutional investors are very good at um, dealing with linear change and incremental change. We're used to analyzing, you know, quarter and quarter, year on year, you know, EBITDA growth, uh, revenue growth, et cetera, and making allocation decisions accordingly. We're terrible at dealing with and planning for exponential growth. And we've seen that over the last decade. Um, and I think with, with climate change acceleration, with technological, you know, cost curves coming down with real implications on where to invest, um, I do think that, you know, just to take an example of, of battery technology, I think clearly there are many areas to invest in early stage venture around the battery, um, around materials, around, you know, business models and services around that. But again, from an allocator's perspective, and Ali touched on this, even just taking that one technology, it, it has ramifications across many, many parts of the portfolio, right? So just to take the next layer, Clearly, implications on your metals and mining uh, exposure to the extent you have existing exposure to uh, to natural resources, metals and mining. That you know, the industry need needs to be retooled, right, to be able to uh, service and meet the demands of a rapidly scaling electric electrification um, theme over the coming decades. Uh, clearly, this will have real implications on the oil and gas, um, you know, part of the portfolio to the extent you still have that. Uh, the broader natural resources and power generation part of the portfolio. Um, with electrification, you know, there will be implications on manufacturing, on industrial, on your transportation infrastructure, charging networks, um, real estate, right? A lot of our real estate managers invest in parking facilities, you know, gas station convenience stores, what happens to those over the coming decades? Um, waste management, Ali, you mentioned recycling, battery innovation, um, you know, there are innovations on the early stage side. And I think, um, you know, a company that came out of stealth, uh, founded by former CTO of Tesla, J.B. Straubel, um, around innovations in, in battery recycling. But clearly on the infrastructure side, there will be real implications on facilities around waste management, circular economy, project finance, et cetera. Um, and ultimately, with all this disruption, right, two of these huge industries, you're going to get a lot of uh, labor disruption as well. So we also think about what, how do you reshape the education and workforce development markets for reskilling and upskilling those who will no longer have jobs, right? Whether in the extraction business, in the, um, you know, in the kind of fossil driven economy, and you do need to reskill those, those workers and quickly to maintain systems wide stability, um, you know, and also aftermarket servicing, right? I think all of that needs to be uh, thought about and considered when you're building a, a portfolio from an institutional investor's portfolio, uh, perspective. Because these portfolio are designed to withstand not just the next quarter or year of, of um, risk and volatility, it's designed to last for decades, right? So you have to think about if you're an endowment, not just the economic um, uh, stability of the next three years and and manage your endowment for the benefit of the class of 2024, uh, but for the class of 2050 and beyond. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. That's great. That's, and that really it speaks to a lot of the long-term nature of these investments, but potentially the short-term return, you know, the kind of the exit that, that could be had in this did, and kind of understanding the trajectory of the technology of how long it's actually going to take to, um, for, it, for it to come to fruition into supply chain. Um, another, we're going to pivot to another area of interesting investment, um, one that I would put it in the probably the not so sexy camp as well, um, and that's fossil fuels or the how tech will um, accelerate potentially the obsolescence of fossil fuels. So, 
wanted to look at, I'm, I'm going to, Lieutenant, I'm going to stay with you, um, you know, just in terms of, you know, how you see that as part of, you know, your portfolio. A lot of your investors have the traditional fossil fuels in their portfolio and, you know, and, and thinking about transition. And so maybe you could talk about a little, maybe some of the technologies you're seeing that are interesting that are addressing that and, and even your perspective of like, well, fossil fuels may be around for a while <laughs> um, and, and, and how that all works in, in the spectrum. Yeah, no, again, I think you need all of the above solutions. You need the disruptors. You also need the solutions that will help the large incumbents transition, right? And you've seen a lot of the, the majors out there make net zero carbon commitments, um, you know, to various timeframes. Um, and even some of the large um, banks that have historically financed uh, oil and gas projects, um, you know, have made those commitments as well to be Paris aligned, to be, you know, net zero or encourage net zero targets uh, with their with their um, clients. You know, a lot of these are, are incumbent industry players. Um, so you, you do need all the above, and and in order to get capital flowing right to those solutions, um, you know, we and, and many others again need to continue to educate that this transition is happening regardless of. Um, of policy or regulation, it's happening because of underlying technology trends, of, of business model trends, and the unit economics fundamentally. Um, and so you need to do that right in a way that ensures, um, and to my point earlier, that that the, the system is still stable and it's not going to generate massive uh, social unrest from from labor disruption, et cetera. Um, but I, I do think that. Um, if you think about institutional portfolios, at least based on my observation, the percentage exposed to traditional oil and gas over the last few years, you know, has substantially declined. And some of that, you know, is catalyzed by, you know, the activism you've seen on college campuses around divestment. So more of a, you know, uh, act activism engagement model. But some of it is just driven by economics, right? This is no longer a risk that is worth taking in, in the eyes of some CIOs, um, that the stranded asset risk is too high, that the um, volatility is, is too high. And I think there's real demand um, disruption and, and degradation, right? That really eats into the economics of these types of, types of assets. And I think increasingly the asset managers out there are, are getting this and understanding that even if there isn't kind of explicit screen on these types of investments, um, they're just not willing to touch these sectors and, and invest in them because of the risks uh, above. Uh, it's, it's economically material um, at this point. And yes, there will be some asset managers and investors willing to play the cyclical kind of near-term trade, but I think they view it as a trade and not a long-term investment. Um, um, because, like you said, right, it, it, there will still be, um, uh, you know, fossil-driven consumption for for many years, if not decades. The question is, where is the value creation, right? And and if you have a choice, right, of all these great opportunities from an investment perspective, you know, why not lean into areas that are uh, unambiguously growing and and creating value? Great. Tim, we have a question from the audience um, and just, you know, of what you're seeing from investors is that, do you think that they're taking climate really seriously? Um, and I guess they, I could be, that's a two part. Are they, what are they saying and then, and what are they doing? Yeah. So we actually, uh, we're, we just wrapped up uh, running a survey. We run every two years with all of our endowment foundation clients and we'll post a formal report on this later this fall. Um, but I'll give you a preliminary preview on this. Uh, in 2016, which is the first year that we ran the survey, we asked our survey uh, participants the question, you know, are you integrating sustainability or impact in your portfolio in any capacity? And in 2016, I think the percentage of uh, respondents who answered yes was about 31%. Uh, two years later in 2018, that number went up a little bit to 36%. And in 2020, uh, this is over 200 respondents at this point. Um, that number is 49%, so close to 50% now, integrating sustainability impact um, in their portfolios to some capacity compared to 31% four years ago. 
And in Europe and in the UK, we know that uh, they're a little bit further ahead than the US. Uh, that number is actually over 60% now. So they've um, not just reached the tipping point, but they've gone way beyond the tipping point in terms of recognizing sustainability as a material factor and, and including that in their decision-making process. So that gives you a little bit of a, a flavor for what institutional investors are kind of the direction of travel. Um, and, and we also ask for priorities within the portfolio on, you know, whether it's, um, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, which obviously have, has become really important. Um, but the number one priority of our respondents is still climate change and resource efficiency, broadly defined. Um, I think 60, over 60% of our respondents answered or checked that box when they were asked about, you know, different sustainability and impact priorities. Um, but we would argue, you know, at Cambridge, and, and, and I'm sure a lot of our peers would say this, that it's no longer just a question to be answered for those um, who are proactively bringing it up, right, by, uh, by the institution to care about this. We should just be thinking about this anyway, because, again, these are long-term material factors that can impact um, many, many parts of the portfolio. And if you're a fiduciary, you have to think about it. Thank you. And, you know, I, I can't let you go yet because I don't want to forget you have a great slide um, that we, we looked at um, and that really it really it captures where maybe some of the investors are or their thinking is because, you know, we we have so much to talk about. But, you know, I think there's been there's some early hiccups or let's say some early um, volatility with climate investing or clean tech or what, you know, what, you know, what, what, what you want to call it, clean tech 1.0, early days of solar and wind. And, you know, there, and there's might be a hangover from investors, you know, as, as they bark on this again. And that's a real issue when we think about matching their goals that you said in, you know, in their stated goals in the survey and what we know of them and putting real dollars in the market. So, um, Li Chen, take, take it. Yeah. Absolutely. I'll, I'll, be, I'll try to be brief, but as you can imagine, one of the common pushbacks we get from institutional investors, uh, especially the, the ones who've been around for a while, um, is, oh, but look at what happened to clean tech the last time we tried this, right? And this story is so well known and internalized by the, by the broader institutional market that it's often the story, right? That clean tech, yes, struggled a lot, underperformed on both an absolute basis as well as on a relative basis. So here we track the what we consider as clean tech companies and, and, and project developers. Um, this data goes back to 2000. Um, we just showed kind of starting in 2005 in those green bars, right? They account for the clean tech companies versus the gray bars, which is kind of the broader VCPE uh, universe in our, in our benchmark. And so story number one is well known, right? That clean tech um, a decade ago just Wrap, you know, dramatically underperformed. And, and they think that that is a story. But if you click on the slide um, uh, one more time, you can see that starting in 2012, 2013, something happened, right? Not only you have the absolute returns rebounding, but on a relative basis, they actually, you know, the clean tech sector has stacked up really well against the broader VCPE benchmark. Uh, and this is all showing companies that had their first investment from an institutional VC or a private equity firm in that calendar year. So the latest cohort of companies, right, are doing much better. And I'm sure any panelist here can, can explain just the incredible amount of innovation, both on the technology side, on the business model side, and also leveraging the incredible talent that's come in. Um, um, you know, whether it's from a software perspective, from a hardware perspective, and, and weaving together the tools, the digital tools that have enabled, um, you know, a lot of these companies to be successful. And on top of that, you have, you know, wind, solar, battery costs coming down, which make the underlying economics much more attractive. So here is what we're, we're saying to investors, like, you have to pay attention. You can't just look at what happened a decade ago right? Um, there's a lot of interesting things happening here and, and it's being shown in the, in the data. This is terrific. Thanks. Well, Chen. I want to post that all over my everything. Um, <laughs> so just, you know, I think keeping on the theme of the, just some of the things that are investors are still working on and maybe that we as a panel can be helpful on, uh, thinking about, you know, portfolio concentration or just risk management, uh, 
Nick, anyone, Nick, Allie, Christina, are there some things that you can think about in constructing your portfolios or even within your technologies that you think would be helpful, you know, for investors to think about? And um, again, maybe it's not just one technology, it's, you know, it's a suite of those, or, you know, as, as Christina put it, you know, it's a whole, it's a, it, it's a whole really sector of, of technologies. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, I, 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 I would like to just raise um, some of the large actors in the room that aren't mentioned. Um, because we look at investors and startups in, in this conversation, some of the largest drivers of this, um, although they are can and can be capricious, are policy. Um, I'm doing work where I'll advise uh, helping the, the UN task force, for example, under the Undersecretary General to finance the SDGs and very interested in how can you apply policy um, to cause crowding in in the market. So for example, in the solar cell sector, one of the reasons that um, solar cells accelerated so rapidly in terms of growth and the cost performance curve dropped so rapidly was the German solar subsidy. So the German taxpayer effectively delivered um, to the world some of the um, you know, cheapest solar panels by driving innovation and throughput through the global innovation process of capitalism. And crowding in is very powerful. Right now, we're going to see that in hydrogen um, via Germany, et cetera. It's kind of the interesting thing um, in, in terms of high density fuel um, replacement, a lot of applications that are hard to decarbonize. The other large policy factor um, is going to be carbon. Um, and this is going to be in commodities and supply chains where the nationally determined contributions between countries um, get ratified under Article 6 with the climate talks potentially next year wherein you will see, and the EU has hinted at this, um, they'll start measuring carbon at the borders. And so all of a sudden import export dynamics, uh, which have been fairly stable under the WTO, um, will get much more variable and you'll see protectionist policies around carbon. Um, that becomes interesting when you're looking at investing um, because are you investing in something that's you know a, a liability or an asset in carbon and where are those export and import markets? And so I just want to acknowledge some of those, what, what we consider, let's say, if we're looking at the physical sciences and the technology, invisible forces that are effectively going to shape uh, the demand shape for some of those technologies, because they are multi-billion dollar uh, technologies. And then as investors, if you're investing in something that is what's called TR, uh, technology readiness level one, two, or three, right, whether you're at the basic or the applied level of science before commercialization, you need policy stability. So the U.S. did terrible in wind and solar using the ITC and the PTC uh, production credits that were basically up for grabs every two years. And so the, you know, every two years there's volatility and, and you're trying to use that to create a stable market for, let's say, um, the credit markets, right, in financing infrastructure. That doesn't work. Those are orthogonal. Um, so uh, some things if you're out there thinking about is we, we want stable policy and look for where things may get crowded in. Um, obviously, there's an election coming up that'll have big factors depending on the outcome and, and drive some of those crowding in policies. And carbon is going to become a lot more important. So low carbon solutions become important. And you may find as a UN, US investor that your low carbon solution may have an end market, for example, in the EU, which is looking at, at raising a carbon border. Thanks, Nick. We love, we love, we love, we can't, can't wait to talk about regulation and, and public policy more. Um, more of the unsexy stuff, but it, it drives it, outcomes, right? <laughs> it, absolutely, it absolutely does. Um, Christina, we, um, what, what is your sense in terms of, you know, or, you know, risk management or when you're thinking about your business and, you know, innovating these different d technologies, what are you, what are you looking at? Yeah, so to me, it's uh, any time where you can create an architecture, where you can uh, collaborate with other innovators, you have a chance to really make a difference. So I am super excited right now to have one of those architectures that I am personally involved in, where we can leverage new material science inventions. They are very difficult to get through, and it's a hard bet to place, but it's a little bit like the medical market when they make a good progress path for themselves in a reasonable time is an amazing investment. And the impact is only then affected by the ability to incorporate. So there are some formats that the industry has already established, whether they are the right formats or not, they're still the formats. Uh, by leveraging global supply chain as much as possible, you drive down costs for free. 
when you have a chance at the same time to uh, navigate against uh, the opportunity through partnerships of big and small companies, which I'm seeing enormous activity on, uh, unprecedented in my career, actually. The number of really very, very large footprint kind of slow movers reaching out to innovators to uh, either test and those tests are basically super tough, uh, bringing bureaucrats through, bringing politicians through, at the same time as when they feel safe, the demonstrations are guerrilla marketing 101. They go to public spaces where they try to get global media attention. And in this day and age, and with COVID, frankly, that has propelled. So having meetings like this of unlikely partners are in some ways easier right now, especially if you have a hard asset in somewhere in a neighborhood of a famous address, you get a lot of opportunity to showcase. And I think there's also a sense of collaboration in general, where if we accept climate change as the boss, we are all working to solve that problem. And it's a meta problem. It is intractable if you do it the old way and completely solvable if we break some of the paradigms that we had signed up for when the investor markets failed so miserably in the early 2000s because it was too rig rigid. Today, we see these unlikely collaborations and we see a willingness and perhaps even a panic around the outcomes if we don't address these. With 50 climate indicators, nine being hit as close to catastrophic, we should be nervous. So. There is nothing like sense of urgency in this one. Christina, I love that collaboration. Um, and I, I believe like that's what we're seeing at PANA is that, you know, the, the intersection between corporates with, you know, with a lot of know-how in terms of execution and innovation, you know, in terms of, you know, the new technologies, working with scientists and engineers, um, you know, and, 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 and investors. And then, and then around the whole top of that is the regulatory environments, you know, that everyone's in. So I'm with you, um, which leads me to a question about just the where, um, where you source opportunities, you know, I want, and I want to ask all the panelists, you know, so where are you finding, you know, your, you know, your new technologies, your new teams, you know, um, how are you going about that? Christine, I, I, you can... I can start if that's helpful. Hi. Hey, Allie. Um, so I would say, as I said before, because of the stage that we tend to invest, um, things are usually kind of right at the edge are usually in academic research labs and we tend to invest right at the point where the incentives of academia and the incentives of commercialization start to diverge. Mm -hmm. um, so I spend a lot of time like talking to academics and researchers, whether it's at you know institutions or at national labs. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean we only invest in those things. We've met a bunch of people and have invested in um, people who were kind of working in a corporate environment in the research area that kind of saw an opportunity. But I think I spend a lot of my time kind of interacting with the research community. And I also think quite frankly, there is a, a huge set of um, untapped uh, talent potential there that historically aren't really seen as the quintessential founders, but that I think we kind of take a, a, a bet on a lot of these people as being the inventors and kind of having the insights about how the techno technology was developed actually leads to a lot of insights downstream of how it can be applied, especially since I think we tend to invest in things that end up being a bit more of a platform that have a bunch of different um, applications. I like Ali, I love that the platform idea because you know, when we think about the scalability and where we need to get to, you know, and that's not to say that discrete projects are not important, but you know, a, a lot of these, it's true, these technologies can be used in, in multiple supply chains and multiple projects, so and they're out there. And I didn't mean to leave out academia, um, you know, as a huge partner in this, I guess, you know, and, and I, I agree with you is that, uh, it's interesting, there's not as close a tie between what's happening at the research labs at a university and what's happening at the endowment office. I definitely noticed that. Um, and so I think that could come together. It's pretty exciting. I actually had a recently um, a university uh, endowment office say, you know, that they, because of COVID, they couldn't travel and they were looking for new ideas. And they said, you know what, we just decided, let's look around town because they were in, an, in a town which had a lot of 
entrepreneurs and then and they didn't even get it far. They went to their lab and, and they said, you listen, we're working on da 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 da. So it, it, so I think there's an interesting thing, you know, a, a community to form and just breaking down barriers even of, of even they're not intentional barriers of just, you know, where you can find that collaboration really easily, especially um, in the US because there's a lot of innovation. Um, so th thinking of the same thing about um, sourcing, um, Li Chen, I mean, I, I feel like everyone must just come to you, but you know, is where, where, you know, where, where are you looking these days, you know, for for investment ideas? I don't know. I think we may have lost the last. Um, Li Sorry, Li Chen. Was, oh no, he's uh, there. Double muted. Sorry. Um, you're you're absolutely right. Somehow these teams do find us, which is great. Um, but I, I would say that of the nearly you know, 1,500 um, opportunities that we're tracking in our database that have some sustainability or impact angle, um, there's a very substantial portion, I want to say it's over 50%, that is focused on climate and environmental sustainability broadly, right? But that's across different asset classes. It could be on the project finance side, focused on uh, construction and operating, you know, stabilized assets um, around renewables, around, you know, wastewater treatment, around um, even indoor agriculture facilities, we're seeing some interesting opportunities, um, all the way to early stage, right? And so the sources may differ depending on the type of, type of strategy. Um, you know, we get a lot of introductions and referrals from our network of existing manager relationships, but also our clients. We have uh, a thousand monthly clients globally and they meet interesting groups and managers, so they'll refer us, um, especially the more up and coming emerging managers that we have historically not followed closely. Um, and we also have um, you know, private clients, right? entrepreneurs themselves who have built successful businesses and are well networked in the entrepreneurial community, and they also are a great source of referral for opportunities. And, and most of these teams that I'm referring to are fund managers, not necessarily uh, startup or direct company uh, investments. Even though we do a little bit of um, co-investments and direct investments, the vast majority of our work with institutional investor clients are on the fund commitment side, making you know LP commitments to, to fund managers. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Is there any questions? Lisa, I actually have one, one more question because, um, because that leads into, and it's a really important, um, point you made about, you know, highlighting or tag, almost tagging the investments that you have, you know, in, you know, your huge network that could be applied, you know, to either to climate or other Im impact areas, which is like, you know, obviously a huge, Function because there's little there's could be elements of that in a lot of different strategies. Um, my question is about the other part of it is that like the, maybe the reporting on the other end, the, like the benchmarks that maybe you know uh, the investor community is is used to using, and how do we start to think about some of these newer things that that are now that show up in some of those benchmarks? I mean it's it, it's a hot it, it's a big topic, so don't you know no need to you know, get, get crazy with it, but just, you know, how you're, I perceive you as a leader in this, how, how you're thinking about this, the benchmarking. Yeah, I think, I think this is a, uh, a symptom or a function, right? Whenever you have an industry in transition, you have the newer players coming in with a different model, different strategy, but you still have to compare them somehow with the existing universe of opportunity. And, you know, when we look at a sustainable real asset, opportunity or manager right because of where the industry is you can come up with some comparables and and um and peers to benchmark them but it's going to be a very limited sample size right a handful perhaps in each vintage year um, yeah. whereas for private equity you, you can probably compare that to dozens right of, of comps per year and so you do have to think about, okay, what is this manager or fund really bringing to the table that is differentiated you know, from a bottom-up perspective to underwrite and, and ultimately to benchmark uh, on, on those uh, bases. Um, but also, if you think about the set of available opportunities, right, by investing in a more sustainable option in the context of 
the broader universe, right? You are making a choice. You're intentionally leaning in and, and, and transitioning your portfolio uh, to a more sustainable future. And, and that is a decision, right? That is a decision from allocators. So if you're benchmarking against the broader pool of, let's say, all real asset strategies for that vintage year, and you do poorly or you do well, I think that is part of the benchmarking um, discussion for whether or not you made that allocation decision appropriately and prudently over time. And fortunately, at least over the last um, few years, since oil and gas assets, traditional fossil fuel assets have underperformed, right? Anything in the renewable power generation, sustainable real assets category uh, have done relatively well, um, you know, on a, in a very general sense. But over time, as we have more and more comparable, right, within each subset or in the broader universe, we will be able to have more rigorous benchmarking discussions with, with clients. Um, but this is not unlike, you know, how we probably had benchmarking discussions on venture capital back in the 80s when we first started recommending venture capital for endowments and foundations. And so you do need to go through that stage and, and that process. Um, but balancing that with the bottom-up material long-term view on, okay, what is actually driving, and I like Nick's uh, reference to first principles, right? You really have to just understand, okay, if you have a clean sheet of paper, regardless of what others are doing and what the um, market is doing right now, right, where should you be directing the marginal, the marginal dollar or whatever currency of, of capital? Okay. Uh, so I want to make sure because we have about 15 minutes left that if there are any questions out, out in, uh, in the audience, um, I do see a question. So would, please anyone answer, um, just you know, raise your hand. Speaking of institutional investors, have you seen interest in investing in your areas? Where have you seen more interest, less interest, and what surprised you, good or bad? So I, can, I can make a reaction, which is so surprising. So I started, uh, I started two different lithium ion battery companies. Uh, the one that I started in the early 2000s, we could not beg off to not do a call on lithium ions revolution at the time. And it got super crowded and uh, due diligence was done in two weeks and everybody was crazy. Of course, um, it got too many, too many dollars for too lofty of goals. And the VC industry was uh, probably part of the failure of those, uh, just pushing a lot of funds too rapidly. What surprises me today is when you look at technology evolution in general, uh, there's almost always to next point, that this is also predictable, like people get really excited when you have a lot of media and a lot of news. And then when it actually starts working, enthusiasm is kind of moving on to the next big media. And I just find it fascinating that we're not learning. So for example, lithium ion, just very specifically, got so much money in the early 2000s, people should invest now. It's taking off and there are so many flavors of lithium ion. It will be here for another 30 years. It is just unbelievable. And yet that's actually not how it's, it feels today. Um, I think we will get there in the next two to three years, but that is so ripe for disruption now. Thanks. I mean, that's a great point, Christina, about just the timing of all of this. And, you know, I mean, and I guess, and if we all could help investors with that a bit, you know, in terms of being the ones on the front line of knowing the, 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 the real timeline for some of these things, that would, I think, you know, that would be a huge service um, from all of us. Ali, what do you, what do you think? And, you know, I, I wanted to get back to, and, um, you know, just in regards to to Lee Chen's slide, you know, about the, you know, the, 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 the performance. Um, but what do you, what maybe, what, what are you seeing? What's interesting? What's surprising to you? Yeah, I think, um, so I think I have been surprised at the level of interest um, from the institutional side with a lot of our portfolio, even on in the early stages. So I think there's, I've seen a trend of them coming um, earlier and getting wanting to get involved more on the, the private side for a lot of sort of our large industrial uh, side of our portfolio. And I think 
Quite frankly, I think the institutional investors will have a huge role to play in enabling this sort of transition to a decarbonized economy. I mean, I think going back to clean tech 1.0 versus 2.0, it's like, I think there have been lessons that have been learned. I think we've seen a lot of new kind of innovative ideas of how to internalize some of those lessons, namely like um, on the technical risk side, I think I see funds sort of internalizing more technical talent and expertise to be able to better evaluate um, uh, technical risk. Um, on the timelines, we're starting to see other funds crop up like with different time horizons or different structures or unique blended capital um, vehicles with you know sharing in um, sort of uh, philanthropic and venture dollars. Um, and I think importantly, we're starting to see, I think a sort of a diversified stack of capital that will exist in kind of what I call the tough tech world. I think it's really un unrealistic to expect that VC will carry it all the way. And I think the institutional investors are essential because I think there remain significant barriers to the scale up of clean technologies that stem not due to the inherent technical challenges of innovation, but because of the market dynamics in which they have to compete. And I think a critical barrier to commercializing these is the asymmetry between project risk for the first of a kind and quite frankly, first N of their kind deployments and the risk tolerance of capital providers um, that typically do project finance. You know, in non-commodity fields, a financer would be able to internalize the increase, increased level of risk for those projects with more interest rate on the capital. But because clean tech firms often have to compete in the commodity market um, until they get to the enough scale of their technology to compete the you know it's not really economically viable and i think the challenge this is sort of a structural challenge in the industry writ large independent of any one company um, is funding kind of these early projects commercial projects um, and i think i imagine that a the institutional investors will have a huge role to play there but also i think Part of the reason why I think I have seen them come earlier is also from an education standpoint. I mean, I think um, a lot of these things are inherently new and novel and it takes time to understand them and to better understand the risk. And so I think that education point sort of uh, to what Li Chen alluded to before um, is really important in this sort of transition phase. Totally, Ali. We yeah, we need we need more um, I guess flexible capital, um, and, and and a bit of an, a bit more understanding about what these companies need. Do you do you see is anyone making any distinctions in terms of investors where when they're looking at clean tech are they more interested in maybe the early stages like you mentioned the lithium opportunity, uh, or maybe and or maybe later stage when, when now we're looking at like how it addresses the the consumer supply chains. You know, is there has there been any like, you know, focus one one way or the other or or neither? <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. I think um, my hunch is that people seem to get, you know, for some of the technologies that are genu gen genuinely an exponential or radical change and will disrupt, you know, not just their industry but the but the value chain upstream and downstream of it, kind of like the battery example that we talked about earlier and how it has implications for metals and mining and natural resources and manufacturing and labor and all these things. Um, I feel like for those, for that sector, um, the level of engagement is on the earlier side because they want to understand how this technology is going to take off and also where to plug in. I, you know, I think when we talked about the oil and gas industry, for example, for a lot of things in our portfolio, there is a lot of synergy there. It's like we have some investments in novel um, electricity generation, but at the end of the day, the piece that's novel is the heat generation. And at the end, and the rest of it is like, it's all the same balance of plant, same stuff. And that's, and that is actually a huge skill set that I think is translatable. And that I think a lot of the um, sort of industry players understand it's a place to kind of plug in and, and, and understand how they can collaborate. Kelly, yeah, yeah I, I agree. Is there, um, Nick, is there, from your perspective, you know, what, what are you seeing? And, and just, and I'll also open it up to, you know, other interesting areas, uh, like, like hydrogen has gotten a lot of buzz 
um, I, I, recently. Yeah, I guess I, I would I would um, you know mention two things: you know, shiny object syndrome, right, where something becomes flavor of the month. Um, and if you're an allocator, I played you know in the hedge fund uh, space and, and and as an analyst and, and portfolio manager, small time, and I was asked uh, in 2008 to pick a, a solar company to bet in right on the public sector solar space. I came back and my boss said, you're going to be the renewable energy guy. Like, Great. I looked through all the solar things. So by the way, everything's overpriced. Um, everything. And, you know, I say that because if you're an allocator and frankly, if you're out there looking for funds, um, the best suggestion to do is to think about betting the race and not the horse. And, you know, what I mean by that is if everybody's interested in something or something is hot, look the other way. Think about it from auction dynamics. I, my family, has a farmland back in Iowa. And so they obsess about land prices, right? And they went in and, and, and they went in and it's like, hey, everyone was there to watch the land auction. I said, that's exactly the wrong time to buy. You want to be in that room when there's nobody else around. And so if you're allocating capital, go find the dark corners, the weird stuff where no one looks. And if you make an investment that everyone either looks at or laughs, it's probably really interesting. Whereas if everybody loves it and the committee's all on board, you can assume everybody else has picked over that thing and the effective yield that's gonna emerge in that space is gonna be pretty much zero. And my guess is Lee Kwan, if, if you were to look at the uh, relative amount of either traffic or interest um, relative to the realized returns, there's an inverse correlation there in any sector. And so I, I would urge you know, those on, on, on this panel who either are looking for money or talking to allocators to really justify and talk about betting the race and to go find the races where either no one's looking or there's nobody there. And that's tough to do because, you know, investing and allocating and managing is very much herd mentality, right? And, and you, you can succeed individually, but God forbid you fail in an individual basis, right? If you fail in a unique way, you're going to get kicked out. And that's part of the meta problem of investing. If you can find good patient capital that's willing to fail in interesting ways and pursue interesting things, you will get the outsized return. And so I would just argue that is is an interesting way to position um, things. Okay. Nick, is there is there uh, Christina or Li Chen any any additional comments? And also a question about uh, just technology geared towards a emerging markets. Um, and you know, just thoughts about that. But you know, please take any any part of that. Any anything new, interesting you're seeing, feedback. Um, how do we, yeah, how do we think about emerging markets? And I guess when I think emerging markets, I think, well, maybe not as much access to, you know, <laughs> renewables and things that, you know, have become, I don't know, almost commonplace, you know, in the, in developed world, but. Yeah, so I can comment on emerging markets and kind of opportunities there. So almost every one of those opportunities um, have a shortage of infrastructure. So getting the solutions and then not only getting it there, but solving it and making sure it works, things fail. This is, we live in a hardware world uh, is really important. And also understanding the culture. So I was part of setting up very, very early on solar towers that had batteries inside the tower. Um, in India, in remote areas. And we completely missed the boat that those batteries were so attractive that they were stolen during night. In fact, that we they shut down their own uh, telecom opportunity and uh, data ports for computers was irrelevant. Those batteries had to be shipped in in cast iron towers in the end. And it became a very interesting experience, but it, it's, um, I think there is a lot of humility when you go through a, a complete failure like that initially. And it's very difficult to um, actually foresee. We forecasted supply chain right, we forecasted the application right, we just did not have the grasp on the local culture. Yeah, it, 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 emerging markets are interesting. It's a broad term to cover a lot. My first degree was um, cultural anthropology with a focus on sustainable economic development in West Africa. And um, emerging markets are interesting because they're so broken. What I mean by that is, you know, if you go in with an energy solution, you may be competing against a diesel generator that's at 60 cents a kilowatt hour. And if you can generate solar at 10 cents or 12 cents a kilowatt hour at industrial scale, that's 
an interesting delta, and it's much larger than trying to replace, um, you know, a nat gas plant in the U.S. or a peaker plant. And so sometimes the places that are broken or ignored can be the most interesting because that very breakage is what you could fix with a new solution. The metaphor that gets abused often in emerging markets is, hey, we're going to um, leapfrog, um, and they use the cell phone analogy, right, where the telecoms infrastructure in the emerging world was basically zero, you know, absent. And then cell phones deployed and instantly the telecoms opportunities in those spaces were huge. That could happen for emerging markets and other tech um, could be uh, water tech, anything, anything where you see something is really, really broken, that's the opportunity. And so you may be, you'll have to study very carefully and respect different distribution channels. You may have to scale differently. The, the best book on that is, is probably Pralahad's uh, The Bottom of the Pyramid, um, where he addresses developing solutions where you rescale, um, et cetera. And frankly, like all good solutions um, for any market, it's about good design and good design is listening. And so you need to, you know, I'll plug anthropologists, go hire an anthropologist to go sit in the field and see what that market really needs. As opposed to, hey, I'm in my Zoom conference room and, you know, the three of us engineers at MIT came up with an awesome thing. That's not going to fly in the village. Um, but if you can get out there, it, it can be hugely interesting and impactful in a very meaningful way. And you'll attract really great people to your company. That is boots on the ground. Yes. Uh, totally. Well, we're just, we're, oh, we can, please. Just wrap it, wrap I'll, I'll it just up. make this very brief. And, and just to double down on the point that I think in, in EM, uh, there is a capital gap we are seeing. It's very clear. Most of the institutional investors, right, based in U.S. or based in developed Europe, um, in general, I think there is a home bias uh, towards the developed markets, um, and it's kind of counterintuitive because you know a lot of the solutions, right, should be deployed in emerging markets over the coming decades with population growth, with carbon intensity in those regions, um, really becoming a challenge. And you need to think about, you know, either um, taking some of the innovations to the emerging markets or developing, importantly, developing the organic and homegrown um, innovations and technology for, for those uh, domestic market uh, adoption. And I think the, in one of the comments, um, someone mentioned development finance institutions. We are seeing some interesting models around blended finance to help catalyze and make the financial traditional investors um, value proposition more attractive. Um, I would say overall, though, it's still it's still uh, tough to uh, have those conversations with with clients who are, especially in this environment, right, dealing with a lot of um, you know risk aversion, right, and they are um, you know still, I think, orienting towards their home markets in general. It it would be really interesting to see developments in capital um, on the equity side of the deal uh, that were analogous to um, green bonds. Right, so the green bond is in business now is $2 trillion. Some argue it's only marketing, et cetera, but it is super interesting. And I'm, I'm helping some groups do that um, with, with BlackRock, but um, we don't yet really have, um, you know, per se green, green equity or uh, emerging markets um, focused VC or capital allocation. I think it's a huge opportunity uh, because there is a lot of impact money out there that frankly is looking for projects that can scale and put capital to work. So most of the impact problem is that the problems don't scale. Um, tech that may scale or be interesting, um, it, it could be if, if, if you're, like I said, raising a fund or all the rest, be an interesting way to come up with a, you know, a, a pure green fund that has some certification analogous to what you see in the credit space and the green bond space, because that now is a, you know, it is, it is now a $2 trillion space. And so it's, you know, quote unquote, legit. This is to me. This is amazing. I'm going to pass it off to Imogen, um, who's going to close up. Um, I thank you all so much. This thank has you. been tremendous, Imogen. Thank you, and thank you. This has been uh, echo Caroline's comments. This has been, and now my dog is going to start barking, having not barked all session. Um, you know, I think this has been such a great conversation. Um, you know, I, it, even I think that the battery example was a really compelling way to think about sort of. What does this mean across the entire investment portfolio and across the entire economy? Um, and you know, it also um, makes me think about the fact that you know, sort of, you know, institutional investors, you know, aren't are not meant to, I mean, are not meant to market time, but they 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 do it all the time, and but they just do it badly, right? And I think that intersection of technology and climate change 
is so hard for investors to get their head around because it involves them looking forward and they're so used to looking backwards and it's really hard for them to square that circle. So I really appreciate all your remarks and all your input and I, and I thank you all. So it just remains for me to um, thank our team um, at High Water Women who, who worked so hard to put this together. Um, thank, also I have to go through the slideshow again because every single time um, PowerPoint keeps kicking it out. Um, so what else I'm going to do? Tell you about the upcoming sessions. Uh, so we have a great diversity innovation and innovation session that is coming up on November 5th. Um, Kristen Hull from Nina Impact Capital is going to be moderating that and it's going to be super interesting. And then um, this actually, you know, to go back to your, the, the uh, green bond conversation, um, we're also going to have a conversation about fixed income um, and the investment portfolio, which I think is, an, an, you know, an important and growing topic of discussion for the ESG community. So please, everyone, do try and join us for that. Um, and then again, thanks to, to the panelists and our amazing moderator. Um, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed the conversation. I thought it was great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. And thank you to our underwriters, Treehouse, Trilete Global, DWS. Um, and thank you to our members for supporting us. Um, become a, if you want to become a member of High Water Women, we, we encourage you to do so. Um, please contact us. You can email Alyssa or anyone on the climate team. Um, and we hope to see you next time or soon at another one of our discussions. So thank you, everyone.